organizers of events uh, like this uh, live in fear, I think, of a particular phenomenon, uh, one that they t usually take very deliberate measures to try to prevent, but it is inevitable. And I speak, of course, of the introducer who thought he was a speaker. The Federalist Society has found the answer. The technique is to invite the person to make his introduction within 15 minutes of the time he enters upon his task. In fact, so unawares was I that I have on Buzz Arnold's tie, who kindly loaned it to me so I would be presentable. <clears throat> notwithstanding the fact it's a very poor match. <laughs> Perhaps I should have expected uh, this, however. I have had considerable experience introducing Brad Reynolds. Uh, as many of you who have attended previous functions of the Federal Society know, of course, I was his uh, deputy for four years and grew very fond uh, and felt privileged to be introduced as simply Brad's deputy. Now uh, that I'm uh, the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel, I'm usually introduced as Brad's introducer. <laughs> of course, it's been easier in the past. Uh, Brad has always been the Assistant Attorney General for the, Office for the uh, Civil Rights Division, and he has recently become the leader of the old fogies. But now he's Moses. <laughs> and the task has become quite difficult. I don't plan to compose an ode here to Brad's skills as a lawyer or his courage and conviction. Now, that would be redundant. We have heard previously at this gathering uh, Many people much more eloquent than I uh, on those subjects. And Brad's a humble man, is embarrassed enough as it is. I don't plan to sing a hymn of praise to his humility and his civility, uh, which have been displayed every day since the summer two years ago when the Senate made the most grievous error, I think, of the decade. I want to keep this I will keep this very very simple in keeping I think with the conservative premises on which we have gathered Brad Reynolds is simply a man in whose friendship I rejoice Brad Reynolds Thank you very much, Chuck. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, embarrassed to, uh, to be up here, to be honest with you. I was greatly moved by the uh, ovation last night uh, that was unexpected and certainly not entirely deserved, and I, I do appreciate it, and thank you all for that. And. Uh, I also want to thank uh, every one of you for your attendance at uh, this marvelous convention. I've uh, had a lot of people come up and congratulate me on the program and the, uh, and the events, and uh, that also is, is a congratulations that's misplaced. There are a lot of people who have put a lot of time and energy into uh, putting together this uh, remarkably fine program, and it was my good fortune to uh, have been asked to serve as the chair, which I am pleased to do and to have done. Uh, but I, I have to confess that really that, uh, that position is one that uh, doesn't deserve uh, the, the nice kind remarks that have been given for how fine a program it is. They go to a number of others, and I will certainly have occasion and take it uh, before this convention is over to uh, to recognize them 
again, I think that they were properly mentioned last night, and uh, and we can't uh, can't thank them enough. As all of you in the room now know full well, the Federalist Society is no ordinary professional organization. It is, as the name suggests, a society of interested and concerned individuals, learned in law, economics, political philosophy, and many other diversified areas of expertise, who are drawn together by a common purpose. And that purpose takes on particular significance in this year of our Lord, 1987. For the task that we have set for ourselves is to promote respect for the United States Constitution as written and amended, and to, and to seek to spread a better and fuller understanding of the thinking of the Founding Fathers as illuminated in their essays, speeches, and letters, and particularly in the document they crafted to constitute our government. What better time than this year, the bicentennial year of the Constitution, for us, for all of us, to focus an intense light on that amazing document. Regrettably, we approach this task faced with formidable obstacles in the form of uninhibited partisan and ideological abuse of the Constitution's language. This abuse is aided and abetted by widespread ignorance of the Constitution itself and of the political theory of those who created it. In case you underestimate just how serious is this problem of constitutional disinformation and misinformation fueled in large part by public ignorance, consider the reaction to a recent state court case in Louisiana. The facts basically are these. Louisiana has had on its books since 1948 a law which mandates the teaching of both the Declaration of Independence and the Federalists. In fact, an entire high school course on the Federalist is required. That part of the law had never been complied with. So last fall, a conscientious law professor at Louisiana State University filed suit against the State Board of Education. And he won. Indeed, a few weeks ago, the court imposed a $500 a day fine on the State Board until it instituted a course on the Federalists. Now comes the interesting part. It seems that the chief of the social studies section of the State Bureau of Elementary and Secondary Education didn't like this ruling at all. He wrote a five-page, single-spaced memorandum to his superiors explaining his reasons. Allow me to read you verbatim some of his reasons why teaching a course on the Federalists, in his words, and I quote, simply cannot be justified, close quote. He has summoned an impressive array of respected authorities in support of his position, and I quote, none of the recently released national reports on the history and status of social studies education mention, much less recommend, a course on the Federalist Papers. <laughs> And I uh, quote further, in the extensive statewide hearings conducted by the state board concerning the high school course of study, not one single reference or comment was made on the need for a course on the Federalist Papers. The chief of the social studies section of the State Bureau of Elementary and Secondary Education of Louisiana also pointed out that no governor of Louisiana, no state legislature, no, not even the members of the State Board of Education had taken a course on the Federalist Papers. <laughs> Needless to say, he considered that fact normative, not uh, uh, rather than uh, tragic. <laughs> Finally, in what uh, medieval writers would recognize as the required appeal to higher authority, he pointed out that the major social studies textbooks give only quote, minimal treatment, close quote, to the Federalist. And he concluded from this that it is, again quoting, 
reasonable to think that major publishers do not think it is suitable material for extensive inclusion in these courses. <laughs> Indeed, he went on to explain, and I'm quoting again, that these same textbooks give very generous treatment to the United States Constitution and to such topics as the advantages of a strong federal government, problems with the Articles of Confederation, powers of the national government, and so forth. He noted, these are the same issues addressed in the Federalist Papers. <laughs> the difference is that the textbook treatment is much more lucid and concise. <laughs> And, and in my opinion, he said, it is a more pedagogical sound approach to teaching students the rationale, principles, and meaning of the United States Constitution. Now, it's easy to poke fun at statements such as these, and they are certainly deserving of disdain and ridicule. But let us not allow our well-placed derisive laughter to drown out the harsh truth that failure to understand and appreciate our constitutional heritage is a shortcoming found not only in our education officials. It is, disappointingly, a characteristic shared as well by an overwhelming majority of Americans outside the legal profession and more surprisingly, by many who fashion themselves as respected law professors, practitioners, and jurists. Equally disturbing from my present perspective is the degree to which those of us in government far too often fall short of affording proper respect to our Constitution and its Federalist system. It is a rare event and a noteworthy one when a system of government endures for 200 years with the original system remaining vigorous and the people remaining free as its founders intended. We Americans tend to think of ourselves as the junior partner in, the, in Western civilization next to Europe. But when you think about it, most of the European nations, while they have political histories far longer than ours, are nonetheless operating at present under constitutional systems scarcely older, in some cases much younger. Alexis de Tocqueville wrote about us from the perspective of a member of an older civilization looking at a younger one. Yet his own country suffered constitutional upheavals at frequent intervals during his lifetime, while ours was developing organically and for the most part harmoniously in fidelity to its founding document. In large measure, the genius of our founding fathers lay in declining to trust the goodness of the rulers to protect the rights of the citizens. Instead, they designed a system of checks and balances, including separation of powers and federalism, intending that the ambitions at one level or branch of government would check the others and individual liberty would be preserved by this permanent salutary tension. Now, how do you throw a system like that out of kilter? If government is restrained by the competing ambitions of different elements within it, where can you go wrong? How has it gone wrong? Well, one way the delicate balance can be upset is if enough of the politicians who make those different elements of government decide that their ambitions are best served by evading responsibility. The framers assumed that those in public office would seek to gather to themselves as much power and authority as legitimately possible. But when the desire to escape accountability comes to eclipse the passion for personal power, then the checks and balances established by the framers lose a great deal of their efficacy. There are all sorts of ways in which constitutionally assigned powers can be reallocated and redistributed by separate branches and levels of government once the leaders decide that their principal in interest is in avoiding the political heat. All of us in government, officials of the executive branch, congressmen, and judges, have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. In taking this oath, 
we do more than merely promise to avoid committing federal crimes. We promise to take our responsibilities under the Constitution seriously. And this will sometimes mean making unpopular decisions, taking political heat, and heat from the press too, and accepting accountability. Yet too often, decisions with profound consequences for our constitutional government are made with no reference or thought given to the constitutional implications. Those more profound considerations are all but forgotten in the rush to respond, invariably politically, to immediate political exigencies. In this respect, none of the three branches currently has much to brag about. I have had occasion previously to catalog the sins of what has been an over-politicized judiciary, marked by a misguided attitude shared by many judges that it is their role to impose upon us their often idiosyncratic visions of justice. These transgressions, which probably reached their zenith in the Warren years, moved what was originally regarded as the least dangerous branch into the legislative and executive arenas with hardly a constitutional murmur, and primarily for politically expedient reasons. The rise of the lawmaking judge was a convenient development for those legislators who privately favored the controversial policy choices that were being made by the judiciary, but would never have risked voting for those choices had they been embodied in a congressional bill. As a result, many of those with theoretically the most to lose by these extraordinary assertions of judicial power were all too happy to acquiesce. Make no mistake about it, there is nothing progressive in judicial lawmaking. Since the early days of our founding, we Americans have taken justifiable pride in the fact that ours is a government of laws and not of men. A necessary foundation of such a system of government is a judiciary that is fearlessly independent, one composed of tough and principled men and women who know that their job will often require the making of unpopular decisions. We tolerate, indeed embrace, this departure from pure democracy because we know how essential it is if we are to truly be able to govern ourselves through law. But the legitimacy of this departure is premised on the notion that the law constrains judges in exactly the way it constrains the rest of us. When the concept of an independent judiciary becomes converted into a license for freewheeling judicial policy making, then the judiciary has become independent of the law itself. And when that happens, we become a government not of laws, but of men. A more primitive system which, in the long run, will prove far less able to protect the liberties our forefathers fought to establish. Rather than dwell again on that familiar theme, let me focus for a moment on equally troublesome failures of the other two supposedly more political branches. An obvious example that can be laid at the feet of my own branch of government, the executive, is our near abdication of the right and responsibility to assert executive privilege when such an assertion is called for. While executive privilege is not spelled out in the Constitution, the Supreme Court has recognized unequivocally what common sense would suggest, namely that in order to fulfill their responsibilities under the Constitution, the three branches have to be able to deliberate internally, construct scenarios, thrash out options, and make tentative recommendations and that such deliberation is chilled when those who give advice must constantly wonder what partisan opponents will think of that advice two, five, or ten years from now. Yet faced with requests from Congress for executive documents, too often we turn them over without sufficient consideration of the ways in which, over the long haul, we might be undermining the capacity of this branch of government to conduct its business in a proper fashion. At times, there may well be valid reasons to waive the privilege. The current Iranian controversy suggests, suggests itself as one situation. But more often than not, 
The question of disclosure comes down to nothing more than a disappointing trade-off between, on the one hand, standing up for our constitutional rights and responsibilities and taking the political heat for doing so from Congress, and on the other hand, abandoning those rights and responsibilities for the sake of some more immediate political advantage. Sadly, the political side of the equation seems invariably to trump the constitutional considerations. And making this wrong choice exacts a heavy price, particularly among those officials of the executive branch whose duties under the Constitution involve giving advice on how the executive may best fulfill its responsibilities. We are seeing firsthand that the Supreme Court was absolutely right in recognizing the importance of confidentiality to the ability of any of the three branches to perform its functions effectively. There are now subtle differences between what government officials are willing to commit to paper and what they insist on stating to you face to face, and understandably so. People are concerned that every word they write down is a potential weapon in the hands of a political opponent. No one can be sure what might be turned over in the future and how it might be read when taken out of its deliberative context. As a result, each time the executive branch declines to exercise its executive privilege when it would have been appropriate to do so, the effect on decision making is dramatically inhibiting. Even more importantly, every failure to assert protection of privileged documents surrenders yet another piece of constitutional turf to a branch of government not originally consigned such authority. And perhaps the most galling as aspect of this abdication of executive responsibility is that it comes too often in response to a congressional document request that is not remotely tied to any legitimate legislative purpose. So much for preserving the delicate balance of power. There are other respects in which the executive branch has failed to uphold important constitutional ideals. I'm thinking particularly of the principles of federalism and of the ease with which we now dictate the most minute details of state and local governance. To be sure, with such egregious decisions as Garcia and with the Congress legislating on issues as minuscule as odometer regulations, the executive branch is not the chief culprit here. But we do not help matters when we write detailed and petty bureaucratic regulations, attach them as conditions to federal funds, and effectively bribe the states to surrender their autonomy. To be sure, in these instances, it is the states that are ceding their legitimate authority by acquiescing in such arrangements, albeit too often with an economic gun figur figuratively held at their heads. But it is most distressing to see so much federal pressure being applied to encourage them to do so. As all of you know full well, the founders established a federal government of limited and specifically enumerated powers, leaving the bulk of governmental authority to the sovereign states. The constraints that the founders placed on the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the states are among the most crucial hedges against tyranny that they should be doing all within its power to support and preserve the framers' novel experiment with federalism through administrative action and litigation. Yet, as so graphically revealed in the administration's recently released report on federalism, which I heartily recommend to all of you, no one can plausibly claim that we are doing anything like that today. We in the executive branch must constantly bear in mind that we have a serious and non-delegable obligation to support and promote constitutional values in everything we do. All three branches, not just the courts, should be working vigorously toward this end. The courts should be the last resort of citizens unjustly deprived of their rights not the only forum in which the important questions of legal authority and governmental structure are debated and resolved. This is especially important given the vast number of instances in which courts are not in a position to vindicate the important constitutional principles that may be at issue, either because, of a particular, because a particular case would present a political question or because no party would have standing to bring the suit or because the constitutional provision in question has been held to be non-justiciable. Courts cannot, and therefore should not, be expected to bear alone the responsibility of ensuring that the government adheres to constitutional principles. That is a shared obligation. 
and it is shared, of course, by the legislative branch as well. Yet Congress, too, must assume an equal measure of blame for disrupting the intended balance. For no less than the other two branches, it also has lost sight of some of its fundamental responsibilities within our constitutional system. It has, for example, as I previously mentioned, to readily ceded its legislative responsibility to the judiciary and all too often forgotten that the congressman's oath pledges in like manner to uphold the Constitution, which should instill responsibility in our elected representatives to make certain that the laws they pass are constitutional. Yet we find Congress repeatedly enacting whatever compromise can be fashioned to appease or at best mollify the most vocal special interest groups on the Hill with little or no consideration given to the most elementary constitutional questions. Congressman Henry Hyde recently called his colleagues to account for such behavior in a well-considered op-ed piece in the Washington Times, citing two examples. One was the grand rubman hollings Act, a measure passed after extended discussion, but embarrassingly with virtually no mention in congressional debates of the possible unconstitutionality of portions of the bill. The other was the Equal Rights Amendment at the time of its reintroduction in 1982, when one of its principal sponsors, former Senator Paul Sankas, appeared before the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution and was repeatedly asked about the effects of the amendment. His testimony was that he was not at all sure, but that we have a Supreme Court to settle questions like that. This all-too-convenient abdication of legislative responsibility to the courts, trusting them to pour meaning into language that appears on the surface to be largely bereft of meaning, is unfortunately no isolated instance. Each time Congress enacts a vague or largely incomprehensible statute, leaving the matter of interpretation to the courts or one of our administrative agencies, it shirks its own legislative responsibility one would expect some reticence on the part of the House and the Senate to openly fudge what the law means. This is, after all, the one branch of the three explicitly possessing authority to set lasting national policy. Yet there seems to be no shortage of examples where Congress has succumbed to the more persistent demands of the most vocal lobbying group and fashion bills that do little more than modulate or temporize differences. More often than not, the end product is an almost indecipherable hodgepodge of loosely related and not entirely consistent legal requir requirements packaged in a single multi-purpose bill. Far better, so the legislators quietly admit, that the political heat on hotly contested issues of the day be redirected to the executive and the judicial branches, rather than remain focused on the less precise and probably more cumbersome legislative process that the constitutional scheme of separation of powers suffers mightily as a consequence, elicits few, if any, cries of concern and none of anguish. Yet while Congress has apparently grown bored with legislating, it has become increasingly enamored of its non-legislative function of oversight. The constitutional basis for legislative oversight has always been that oversight can, in some instances, be a necessary predicate to a determination of whether to propose and enact legislation. And therefore, it is a proper exercise of congressional authority. But now, more often than not, congressional oversight activities are completely detached from any discernible legislative task and exist simply as a means of congressional micromanagement of executive action. The Vice President spoke of this phenomenon yesterday as it relates to foreign policy matters. The problem with the trade-off that Congress has made, less legislation and greater oversight, is that it serves to successfully shield the Congress from public accountability for the policies and conduct of the federal government. Congress can freely perform its oversight activities without any fear that it will become responsible to the public for the executive actions it reviews. Congressional committees do not have to make the hard executive choices when issues arise. All they need to do is hide in the hills while the battle rages and emerge when it's 
when it is finished to shoot the wounded. The abdication of legislative authority and this usurpation of executive authority called oversight are really part of the same syndrome. The exercise of power without accountability. I could go on at some length with a parade of such horrible stories, but I think the point is made. The framers fully expected the states and the three branches of the federal government to seek to aggrandize their power. And they made provision for just such an eventuality by creating a system of checks and balances designed to inhibit this tendency. What they did not foresee was that the states and the three federal branches might choose to reallocate a measure of their legitimate authority all too happily for a short-term political gain. Yet that is precisely what we are experiencing with some interesting trade-offs. Most states have all but surrendered what is left of their state sovereignty for the privilege of receiving federal financial assistance. The Congress has elected largely to abdicate its legislative responsibility and assume the politically more comfortable position of government overseer and general troubleshooter. The executive has opted too often to abandon its only exclusive privilege in order to stifle criticism and has expanded far too aggressively through the regulatory process into the legislative arena. And the judiciary has lost sight of its traditional judicial role in favor of a more active legislative agenda. In a word, the balance we have today does not remotely resemble the one struck by our founding fathers. While the framers warned against factionalism, they knew there would be robust politi uh, politi politicking in American government. But they expected, at least, that the politicians would operate within the constitutional framework of delineated responsibilities, undertaking to discharge their respective obligations as forthfully and faithfully as possible under such a federalist regime, and recognizing the need to make certain political sacrifices in order to do so. Hardly did they anticipate that American politics would turn into a sort of shell game, where the P is nowhere to be found, but under each shell is lodged yet another explanation of why the P belongs somewhere else. The result has been a multipolar equilibrium of buck passing, and unfortunately, it is a stable one. The question to be asked and answered is this. The 200th year of our constitution, is, is this in the, in the 200th year of our constitution? how to find our way out of the current state of affairs and back to the original constitutional design that is worthy of our celebration. Badly needed today is a political culture conscientious in its observance of the original constitution. Officials in all three branches, as well as in the states, must rededicate themselves to the principles of our founding charter, and so must we the people. It is my belief that what is needed for starters is a sense of boundaries, an intellectual awareness that constitutional mandates and limits are not mere intellectual constructs. They are daily realities that must be observed when they are difficult as well as when they are easy. Otherwise, the Constitution will survive as at most a set of lofty sentiments, perhaps much admired but little observed. That explains why the task that the Federalist Society has set for itself is so critically important. There are people, thoughtful people, who are devoted to constitutional principles. The challenge is to take full advantage of this bicentennial year to raise public awareness of the importance of those principles and the Federalist construct within which they operate. In order to sustain our survival as a nation whose democratic form of government remains unique in all the world. This society is called conservative, and there is obviously a very real and important sense in which that is true. But the more significant point to me is that the Federalist Society is dedicated not to short-term fixes, but to searching out long-term solutions solutions grounded firmly on enduring constitutional principles 
that cannot be, indeed must not be, conveniently bent, reshaped, manipulated, or penumbered to death. <laughs> to s- in order to suit the politics of the moment, including sometimes conservative politics, or the personal predilections of those intent on having their particular view of social order substituted for the Founding Fathers' view. The bicentennial of the Constitution must be more than just balloons and hoopla on a great party. It would be a shame if well-intended self-congratulations were to drown out the sober reflection that is also required. Thankfully, such reflection is beginning to take hold, and the Federalist Society, with meetings such as this, is showing the way magnificently. I commend you, I thank you, and I urge you to carry on. Thank you very much.